The story presented in this program is deduced from this drop of blood. However, it's also first and foremost the story of these three children with a striking resemblance, but differing greatly due to a minute variation in their genetic material. To start our journey, let's accompany our first character somewhere on our planet, in the nice setting of a playground. Let us now imagine a simple fall, causing these few drops of blood to appear. During the next stage, we will explore this child's tissues to travel through one of the blood vessels from where these drops of blood came. In these blood vessels, we see the actors who will play a determining role in the coagulation cascade. Red and white blood cells. Coagulation factors, including fibrinogen, and now blood platelets heading towards the open breach in the vascular wall. In the blood flow, we also see an agent called factor 7A. Making use of this breach, factor 7A escapes from the blood vessel to find an accomplice, tissue factor, situated on the surface of fibroblasts in the blood vessel wall. These two accomplices become associates and act as a true detonator. Via interaction with other factors, this complex then stimulates thrombin production. This step is called the initiation phase. The coagulation cascade then continues to amplify. Thrombin produces platelet activation. At this point, other essential factors, coagulation factors, intervene. These coagulation factors then adhere to the surface of activated platelets in a cascade. At this stage, two factors play a predominant role factors 8 and 9, which we can now observe. By adhering to the surface of activated platelets, these factors induce an explosive production of thrombin. Now thrombin possesses an essential property. It ensures conversion of fibrinogen into fibrin so a stable and resistant clot is formed. In the middle of the clot, activated platelets produce even more thrombin. Which in turn activates more platelets. Once more, due to the action of factors 8 and 9, which adhere to these platelets, massive quantities of thrombin and fibrin are released further stabilizing the clot formed this way. We have now explored the coagulation cascade as it takes place in normal physiological conditions. The second part of our story will reveal the mechanisms responsible for haemophilia. For a better understanding of haemophilia, let us return to our three initial characters and focus our attention on the genetic material of the first actor. Among the 46 chromosomes, let us isolate the X chromosome. The chromosomes contain a series of codes responsible for our identity. Let us now isolate the DNA of this chromosome, followed by a sequence of this DNA. This DNA sequence, symbolized by this succession of letters, is crucial in our story. These genes are responsible for factors 8 and 9, 
crucial elements in our coagulation cascade. Now let us examine the genetic material of the second actor. When we examine the same DNA sequence, we note a slight mutation, symbolized by a slight change in the letter sequence. This minute difference will have profound consequences. Returning to our playground shortly after a simple accident, we find the drops of blood. Let us return to the tissues and the blood vessel. Our two accomplices have initiated thrombin production. As a result, platelets are activated. However, at this stage, our genetic mutation will play an important role. This mutation in the DNA sequence results in factors 8 or 9 deficiency. The activated platelet is no longer stimulated by a series of factors. Consequently, thrombin production remains limited. As we can see, fibrinogen is no longer converted into fibrin. The amount of fibrin is insufficient, the number of activated platelets remains limited and a stable clot cannot be formed. The vascular breach is not closed and the hemorrhage cannot be controlled. Now let us look at the blood vessel from a little distance in order to localize it better. As we see, this blood vessel is situated in a joint such as the knee. In the case of haemophilia, the blood flow from the breach in the wall of the blood vessel will, in a way, inundate the joint space. This flow of blood will have several consequences. First, the synovial membrane lining the joint will act as a sponge and absorb this blood. This in turn produces hypertrophy of the synovial membrane. On the other hand, our body will attempt to eliminate this blood by producing inflammatory mediators which will also cause erosion of the bony cartilage. The hypertrophic synovial membrane itself also contains numerous small blood vessels. If pinched, these small vessels will rupture and cause more bleeding. This initiates a vicious circle, resulting in new joint degradation followed by functional problems which can become irreversible. To conclude, this coagulation disorder is called haemophilia, a hereditary disease affecting males transmitted by women and characterized by a more or less severe factor 8 or 9 deficiency. In the next stage of our program, we will see how this disorder can be corrected and, in particular, how a preventive attitude can be adopted. For the third step in our course, let's start with the third child this time. As we can see by examining its chromosomes and its DNA, it also presents a genetic mutation resulting in factor 8 or 9 deficiency and subsequent haemophilia. Let us now return to the blood vessel when bleeding occurs. As we can see by advancing in our blood vessel, this situation can fortunately be corrected by the administration of factor 8 or 9. These factors, administered for the purpose of treatment, can be from two different sources. They can either be purified from donor plasma or be produced by biotechnology. Let us return to the blood vessel. After administration, 
part of the injected factors will react with blood platelets. As a result, an explosive quantity of thrombin is released. This thrombin activates other platelets and induces conversion of fibrinogen into fibrin. A stable and resistant clot is formed progressively and the vascular breach can be closed. Part of the injected coagulation factors remains as a reserve in our blood vessel. However, when we circulate with these factors in the blood vessel, we note that this reserve is used up completely after three days. The result? No more coagulation factors are available to respond to a new vascular breach. If this occurs in a blood vessel situated in a joint, it can cause further irreversible damage. Let us compare the situation to that in another blood vessel, where an amount of coagulation factors is still available thanks to preventive injections. The microscopic breaches that inevitably occur in this blood vessel can be closed at any time. The result? Let us leave the joint and return to our daily environment. This preventive attitude will also enable us to perform some physical activity, which in turn will reinforce the joints. Briefly, via prevention, treatment and physical activity, it's possible nowadays to control haemophilia. As a result, our three children can enjoy a similar quality of life despite their different genetic material.